Hi, welcome to another video on the Blue Abroad YouTube channel. In today's video, you're going to see a conversation between myself and Chris Judd. We talked all things footy, all things life. We got some perspective on what's happening with the current list, what's happening with the future of the list, and I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel and enjoy. Juddy, it's a pleasure to have you on the Blue Abroad YouTube channel, mate. Thanks very much for having me on. Looking forward to uh, being a part of the show. Absolutely. Well, why don't we start with you? How's life? How is your your world on, on this side of the, the fence these days? It's good. It's hard to believe. I, mean, I haven't played a game of AFL footy for eight years, which um, it feels like it's gone very quickly in my world. So with four kids, uh, keep me busy. I've got a, a new business venture. Um and that eight years just feel like it's gone um, gone by incredibly quickly. So, uh, very much a, a passive footy fan now, but you know, still enjoy getting down there and just watching the team, and and you know, particularly on games like the weekend, being able to relax and enjoy a, a, a comfortable win. How do you absorb the game now that you are you know, pretty removed from it from a playing capacity? How do you absorb it now, knowing you've got kids that are interested in the game as well, and? I guess, you know, life experience afterwards. Very much just as a fan now. And I've really enjoyed that, just being able to watch the game and not be as emotionally involved. And so if we have, if, if we have a loss now, I'm, I'm not grumpy for the, the next three days or it, it, it comes and it goes. And I, more than anything, I just feel for the players when, when they are under heat because I, I do remember that, what that feeling's like when it's not going how you want and it just feels like the walls are closing in on you. So... Felt like we had about a six-week window where that was happening at the Blues, but you know the last month of footy they've put together has been been really impressive, and the wins are good, but but more so probably the style of game has been um has been much better to watch, and and hopefully something that they can really build on in the years ahead. Yeah, there's there's a journey that we've gone on here on the channel where we've tried to work on our equilibrium because obviously the lows <laughs> get pretty low when we when we're so passionate, and the highs get pretty high. How do you, I guess you, you were on the inside and obviously a, you know, a leader at the club, um, both on and off the field. How do you manage that equilibrium of not getting too high, not getting too low? I, I found it really hard. Obviously, when I was playing or, or involved with the club uh, in an off-field capacity, um, I found it almost impossible, to be honest, because it, it, it does feel like it's your whole world. But certainly now... Um, I'm able to do it a lot easier and, and enjoying just being able to see it as a game that, that, that should be fun. But yeah, for the most part of my adult life, football was almost, it was almost life and death. Um, so I'm glad to have removed myself from that level of, of passion and, um, and can sit there and, and, and just be a fan and support the club and, and empathize when things are going badly and, and enjoy when, when things are going well. Yeah. I remember when you first got to the club, and you did a few interviews, well, you did many interviews, but some of them you spoke about the notion of, you know, footy players and role models and how that wasn't necessarily the case for you and how you didn't see yourself as a role model. How do you view that notion now? Uh, yeah, it was funny. I, I remember saying that and just got the most ridiculous amount of press, that statement. And, and yeah. my main thing from that at the time was just to not bother saying anything that could lead to um, lead to more press because my, my core business was was playing footy and that's what I was interested in and and the hysteria that sort of created was was interesting looking back. Um, I mean, my position is people are people, no matter what their profession. To to uniformly say that one group of people, whether that's accountants or doctors or footballers or pilots, are better than any other profession. I mean, has always seemed pretty ridiculous to me. Um, but that's not a, share, a view shared by by um, by everyone, and I, I guess in a lot of ways the games, you know, makes its money off off um, you know public f funding and, and having the players as very much as brands that can be commercialised. So I get why why so many in the in industry are passionate about you know football as being role models. But but certainly if I was to to talk to my kids about who you should choose as role models for, for me, the advice would be choose someone you actually know because, um, you know, choosing someone based on the caricature that they're portrayed in the media is, isn't, doesn't always correlate one for one with, with what they're like in real life. And there's plenty of brilliant people out there who, who don't have a high profile, who, who make brilliant role models. 
Yeah. I mean, I remember I was, you know, I was a teenager at the time. I was 16 at the time when I heard that rhetoric. And I think, you know, I'm 32 now. So for the most part, the players that I watch are younger than me. So I think early on you latch onto the individuals as your heroes. And then later on in life, you absorb the community that is a footy club. And I think the older I got or the older I get, the more I understood what you were talking about initially. Well, when you look at them now, I mean, that's how I feel now. Like you look at these guys and they're kids, you yeah. know. And, and I mean, I didn't realise it when I first started playing AFL footy, but but they really are. They're, they're in their, you know, a lot of them are teenagers or in their early 20s and their life experience consists of high school and then football. And, and to be honest, they're almost pro- quasi-professional footballers from about the age of 16 now. So, you know, to lump the, the level of responsibility we sometimes do on young guys with such limited life experience um, seems odd, but, but you know, I don't, I don't sort of make the rules, not, not I spend too much time thinking about it these days. But, yeah, it always seemed peculiar to me. Of course. How do you see the evolution of the game? I mean, you've been removed for less than a decade and I feel like a lot has happened since... I reckon what's happened in 12 months. Yeah. I think the change from the game. Yeah, I mean, the AFL did that. that there's been a lot of rule changes. And, and I think they did really nail a chunk of them with that, particularly the 666 and things around that period where they really improved the game. I mean, even that encroachment on the mark, on the side of the mark, I mean, that they miss a heap of them. <laughs> It is a bit of an issue, but it has improved the game a lot. But it, it's hard because you know if you if you um, officiate it to the letter of the law, you'd be pulling up those free kicks every every minute or so. It feels, but um, yeah, like, I think they've done a good job of that. Um, and even I remember when I was playing, it was almost a rule you wouldn't really handle forward. You'd handle back and you'd kick forward because the forward handle would lead to the ability to tackle pressure. But I've loved seeing. And Collingwood were probably the leader in it, the amount of forward handballs in games now. And both the risk that's brought on, but it's just really entertaining to watch. Um, and teams are taking far more risk than they did, particularly when you think back to sort of that 17, 18 period where the style was really slow kicking ball movement and a way to counter-attack good tackling teams was to just not handle. So I think the game's enjoyable to watch. Um, gee, I just think how demanding it must be to play. Because even the last 12 months, just that repeat sprinting that you see the players do, gee, I think it's gone up, I don't know, when I mean, you throw out a 15% number to it. Whatever the number is, the intensity of the game is just um, is just manic. What about from the consumer's point of view? So from, from my lens, obviously, have always been a fan, always watched the game. Um, for the most part, it's been a linear experience, whereas now there's that, third screen when I'm looking at the stats or my fantasy or whatever else. How do you see the evolution of the way we consume the game now? Uh, it's got some challenges. I, mean, I think people's just attention span is just reduced so significantly as the number of media options they have increased exponentially. Um, yeah, I think the game goes for a long time. You know, when you compare it to other sports or, or other media products people consume. Um, and it wouldn't surprise me to see that get shaved down, you know, over time. I, I think probably 15 to 20 minutes shorter could make sense, um, you know, over a whole game. Um, but it, like I said, it would mean there's more close, the number of close games would be increased. I just think media people's attention span is getting lesser and lesser. Um, but, yeah, look, I, I think, you know, obviously things like eSports have been wildly popular and, and there is a trend towards um, some other type of, of consumer products. But I think by and large people still love the competitive aspect of that, that AFL brings. Um, you do see the popularity of American sports encroaching in Australia and, and soccer as well and, and wonder if, we will see more um, sort of global-based sports. So there's certainly a lot more people following overseas teams in different sports now than when I was a kid. It feels more common amongst adults and, and kids alike. 
and whether or not that's going to keep happening um, would maybe be a concern for the AFL. But by and large, from where I sit, it looks like it's in a, a pretty good place. Yeah. And how about this team that we that we watch right now? How have you watched their growth? Obviously, you've had a bit of an overlap at the start of some of the boys' careers with with the end of yours. How have you watched the evolution and the development? I think the concern for me, and I think a lot of Carton fans at the start of the year, was just um, how slow we were playing compared to other teams, and that felt like it was just going to be hard to felt like it was going to be hard to score enough when we were living long down the line with. Um, but that's just really transformed the last, um, you know, probably six weeks or so. Really, uh, at the start, it wasn't working, and then you know, it started to to click in and see the aggressive ball movement off half backs been brilliant to watch, and and some of the tackle pressure that's not just started well in games, but been consistent throughout the whole games has been um, it's been really impressive. So, yeah, I mean, that, that's sort of the thing. I'm most pleased with just the style of play that, that you're seeing the guys play with and the amount of risk they're willing to take on. And it's funny when you do go quick and, and make mistakes, often it, it works out anyway. And we've got such dangerous forwards. If you can give them opportunities where the ball has moved quickly, um, you know, their ability to capitalise is first rate. So, you know, we've got a huge test this Friday night. But, but um, yeah, certainly the last four weeks feel, feels like there has been a bit of a turning point. Yeah, I mean, from this side of the fence, it seemed like they were thinking a little bit too much. And I think in this game, if you're thinking for 0.5 of a second on the field, that's the difference between executing and not executing. And obviously, we've heard press conferences and, and read articles about how the game plan has been a little bit you know, simpler or simplified. How much of a, an impact do you think that's actually made on the way that we're playing now? Pretty removed from it, so it's always hard to tell. And a lot of it's, a lot of it's just psych, psychology. There may not have been a huge shift in game plan. There may have been, but it, it almost looked um, a few months ago that, that they were playing to not lose, as opposed to playing to win. And mm-hmm. you know, when you play to win, you have to accept that you, you take on some risk, and and you really have to embrace mistakes because it is a game of mistakes. No players ever played the perfect game. No teams ever played the perfect game. Um, it's just about how you butter up once those mistakes have been made and, and whether or not you're able to overwhelm those mistakes with, with good things that happen as well. And that's what we've seen the last month. Um, you need to risk something to gain something, and they're, they're doing that really well. Whether or not there's been a huge shift, I mean, there's, I think there's no doubt there's been quicker ball movement off half back. I think that's been consistent. And the number of times I see the ball banged 55 metres long down the line to a scrum of 10 players. I mean, that's definitely reduced um, as it has across the whole competition this year. So I think that's pleasing. And, um, you know, we're going to have a few injuries to deal with now, but um, it's certainly the the more one-on-one contests we can get into to Charlie and Harry when he's back, um, the better for our footy club. Hmm. It's such a unique sport given that there's, you know, 36 on the field at one time. How hard is it to get a total buy-in from everybody on the field at, at one given time? Oh, it's incredibly hard. Um, and I think too, because the on-fields, the 18, or the, the 18 players you're looking at them before on the bench is only a small part of it too. It's, it's, it's so dependent on uh, all the moving parts in a footy club from the, the sports science to the, the coaches, to the administration, to the recruiting. Um, and I, you know, because there are so many moving parts, that's what makes it so special uh, when, it, when it does really flow and really work. And, you know, you feel a bit grubby saying it, but you watch Collingwood and they're great to watch at the minute. You can just yeah, feel that, that they're in that spot where admittedly they've still had plenty of things that have gone wrong off field and, and in recent history, but it's being overwhelmed by the amount of things that are going right. And as a, a Carlton person, you, you do feel grubby saying it, but it's, you know it when you see it, don't you? And, um, and what they're doing at the minute is is exciting to watch, and it, it looks like it'd be good fun to be a a Collingwood fan at the minute. Yeah, well, Friday night at the G Pies Blues. The last time I remember us beating Collingwood of any significance was a Friday night, twenty twelve, round three. Never forget it. Um, it's been that long, mate. That was God. yeah, eleven years ago. That was no that way. Was That's the last. last- 
Last time we beat in Collingwood. No, the last time we beat Collingwood uh, of significance, oh, was, in my yeah, opinion, yeah. was, oh, was, was, was twenty twelve. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, okay. I remember that really clearly. I remember that was the one time in my life that I felt, oh, oh, we're actually we're we're going to win the flag, or we're going to be good enough to at least. Was it the start of the year, wasn't it? it? Was about round four, wasn't it? Yeah, round three. Yep, and yeah. then we had all the injuries. Um, Carazzo the week after Murphy yeah, the collarbone, he exists, wasn't he? I remember. I remember. Yeah. What do you look at for this Friday night? Can we do it? What are the keys? Uh, well, we can. I mean, they're, they're clearly the best team in the comp at the minute, but um, they're certainly not infallible. But yeah, they'll be hard to beat. I, mean, I think you've just got to you've just got to try and meet fire with fire and go quick. And and the tackle pressure Port put on them was really impressive. Um, and Port, you know, gave themselves a, a chance to win. So I think we're going to be without a few. It'll be interesting to see if we get Chera and Cripper back. It sounds like perhaps Cripper more likely than. Than Chera, um, and I guess Walsh hasn't been ruled out yet, or he has. At the time of filming, no information. Um, we'll just you wait on that one. Un- you think it's going to be pretty unlikely, um, think- but a huge challenge. But yeah, look, I, I think there's a, um, you know, there, there's certainly more than a chance. If we if we bring the sort of intensity and ball movement we had the last month, you know, more than capable of beating any team. So. That's all you can do against the informed team in the competition. Yeah. And zooming out with this group on a high level, what are what do you think are the layers that are needed for us to continue to go to that next step? Just think to keep building that running power, which has really started to come. Um, you know, you're seeing some of the young guys that we've introduced off half back, whether it's, you know, Boyd or Kemp or Chinquota or, um, you know, can complement some of the other guys we've we've got uh, in that team. And the, the, the quick ball movement, I think, is the the thing that really stands out. Um, you know, I think, you know, Charlie and Harry are obviously really dangerous, but you, you're sort of seeing some of the smaller forwards really become dangerous players as well. And and, and I think the, the age profile we're doing it with, you're seeing it's not just the same guys playing well week in and week out. You're seeing a, a broader mix. And, and some of those guys are... You know, 19, 20, 20 run year olds coming through who are going to be better this year, better next year, and better the year after. So I think when you get that age profile on your list, that's when um that's when it starts to become pretty exciting. Yeah. With your situation, I'm curious around your thoughts around list building, because obviously, uh, you know, with you, we had gone to the draft already a few years prior to that. And obviously we bring you in as the experienced leader that you were at the time. How do you see those trade-offs by getting a player who's already in their prime in exchange for the draft picks or just continuing to build the list from the ground up, so to speak? I think it depends on what you've got at the time and what you need. Um, You know, there would be time when clubs lower down the ladder in need of of leadership and potentially sacrifice draft picks to do so. And and obviously when clubs are in that premiership window, uh, you know, taking advantage of things like free agency just makes a lot of sense because it is so deflationary when you are a good team. Players are prepared to come and play for less. And if you can get good players in the door without having to give up anything, as what happens with free agency, uh, it makes sense to take advantage of that. Um, you know, if I were to look where Carlton's at now, I, I probably think it's a phase to be drafting for the next, so this year and, and perhaps next year as well. And we've brought some, some mature age talent in. And and some of that's really hit. You know, Chera's last or Chera's year really is probably leading the VNF or yeah. Um, you know, he's had a great year. Um Acres has started to hit some form too, which has been good. Um so I, I suspect, and again, I have no insight um into it, but I suspect the club will probably go to the draft certainly this year and, and maybe next and um and then see where they're they're sitting then. But what was pleasing, you know, if I were to look at where the gaps were in our list, I would have probably said running power. Um, but I, I, just about everyone that came into the club last year w- was an elite runner from my understanding. I mean, you, you don't have to watch Holland and he's just a brilliant runner on field. So I think um, some of the gaps that were maybe there are starting to be filled. And obviously a first, you know, guys in their first year don't fill it, but the, the more – of them that are on your list, the more likely that that gap's going to be closed in the next year or two. So, um, 
you know, from where I sit, I, th- I think the list is starting to look pretty balanced. Yeah. Well, fingers crossed that the the last five games have been a an insight into what's going to happen at the end of the season and for years to come. Juddy, mate, time is the greatest asset and I uh, appreciate you giving up some of yours to chat with us here on the channel and uh, obviously just want to thank you for your contribution to the club. Uh, for me, I was a 16-year-old as you arrived, so a lot of my early memories came from watching you play. Um, so to be able to chat with you now and uh, meet Chris Judd the human, not just the athlete, <laughs> it's, been, uh, it's been a pleasure. That's awesome. Thanks very much for having me on. Enjoy the chat. Go Blues. Cheers. Go Blues.